So I am here with Ian Rogers, uh, the head of Topspin Media, and uh, thank you for sitting down with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, your panel um, that you're moderating uh, later this afternoon is what music companies need from startups. Is correct. that correct? Yep. And so you're going to be sitting down with Warner, Universal, and um, you know, some of the major yep. players. Right, and a, and, a, and a couple of entrepreneurs and in an attempt to have a, have a discussion about what, what music companies need. It's, so for me, yeah, Brian Zisk from SF Music Tech asked me to, to come moderate. It has you know, some to do with Topspin, but, but mostly not. I, I'm, I've been working with, uh, with big music companies since 1994 in a variety of capacities right. and um, you know, was, you know, did, did consulting work in the early days and then was uh, part of Nullsoft and, and we, you know, in, in sort of 98, 99, we're trying to deal with, with big music companies who were just starting to get their heads around what the hell we were even talking about. Right. Um, and then was, and then I did New Media at a record label which was distributed by EMI. Um, so I had that experience and then had another little startup which we sold to Yahoo and then was part of Yahoo Music and at Yahoo had a lot of, you know, had, had major relationships with, with, all, with the big music companies. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is coming, having been kind of both on the AOL side with Nullsoft, mm -hmm. having been on, on the Yahoo side with, with um, or also on the consumer side at Yahoo, but then also having been on the label side, been an entrepreneur, I'm going to try to draw You're out a, of these people. You're a true moderator in this I'm going to try to, yeah, exactly. I'm going to try to draw out of these people the conversation around, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not startup company and big company, it's entrepreneur and a person at a big company who's trying to do their job, right. and how do you how do you break down those walls and actually offer something of use? So that's what we're going to try to talk about. It's interesting because uh, we spoke with uh, Jan Del Sandro earlier this morning, and in the panel she was in about the sort of cutting edge legal issues, there was the distinction brought up of you know companies that ask for permission and companies that ask for forgiveness, and uh, you know it was sort of like in a startup world if you. The point was, if you went through and got every single license that you need just to get off the ground, um, you know, good luck. Yeah. Um, but in, in Topspin's case, you know, you might have sort of caused a few ripples when you first emerged, but I would say that you've become invaluable to the labels as a service and to connect, connect their digital presence. Um, would you say that you are a permission or a forgiveness person? Um, you know. I have to say, historically, what I've done is tried to build businesses which require neither, hmm. right? You know, to to build businesses which are, you know, if you're on the consumer side, I think it is very hard to go get permission up front. So you have to build a business model which is which is useful and not illegal. Right. Um, you know, I don't think that you know no one has really built a successful business on copyright infringement long term. At the same time, no one's built a successful business asking for permission either. Um, you know, even even Pandora, which is which is now I think you can call a successful company, is successful because the licenses are statutory. Right. Um, so I, I think for us with Topspin to answer to answer that point, you know, part of the reason I wanted to leave the consumer facing side, and I, I left Yahoo and turned down some gigs which were also consumer facing and come to Topspin is because I wanted to work with people who actually wanted my help, mm. right? I was tired of, as Yahoo, you know, every time you'd make an advance, a big company would come and say, you know, okay, well, I need 10 more percent then. Um, mm. I just realized that, that it was sort of fundamentally broken. Whereas if, when you're talking to, uh, when, you're, when, you're, when you're talking to, to artists, managers, um, and, and labels about giving them the tools, the infrastructure and tools they need to run their business, then they say, oh yes, please, thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. And you might, you, know, you might have um, mismatch of you know, the price they want to pay is not the price that it costs sure. to make it, and you've got those sort of market issues, but at least people generally look at what we're building and they go, wow, that's really useful, and no, I'm not going to build it. So there's sort of an intrinsic value where I think they, they might look at some of the consumer services and they go, I don't know that we really need that. Um, I was I was in a, a meeting when I was at Yahoo, and I won't I won't name I won't name names uh, because it might it is for fear of getting myself in trouble. But Fair enough. you know there was a meeting um, you know back when the radio royalties were for streaming were not yet decided. Um, 
And so we all get together, it's sort of sound exchange and their constituents, which is labels and artists and artist representatives, and then the companies who pay sound exchange. So Pandora, Yahoo, AOL, Real Networks, et cetera. Trying to come together and, and come to an agreement on what these royalties should be so it didn't have to go to court, which it eventually did. Um, and one of the major record companies started off the meeting by saying, we just want to get one thing straight. If anyone thinks we care if internet radio lives or dies, you're wrong. Wow. Um, so I think that's when it's really hard, right? When, when, when there's, there's not even a perceived value on the other side. Mm. It's hard to come to, to you know, come to a, a, a meeting in the middle. You know, thankfully with, so that's why we've kind of with Topson we've gone the direction that we've gone is because there's not really a question, is what we're doing valuable? Everyone can nod their head, generally speaking, right. and say, yeah, man, that's cool, that's, that's hard. Right. They're putting real software dollars against that, it's software we're not gonna build. Right. And then you, you, know, you, might, you might have disagreements about some of the finer points, but you know, in general, you wanna build something where people you, see you, the value. Like, you, the, does Universal Music Group see the value of Groove Shark? Well, they can Clearly see the, the uh, yeah, no, not with right. Groove Shark, for sure. Right. Um, you mentioned, though, with uh, Pandora, you know, once the, the rates became statutory, um, that they were able to ba build a business around it. Um, still with, I think, you know, it's like half a million a year to each label plus 70% or so mm -hmm. revenue. And it creates an environment where, you know, if you're a VC thinking about investing in a startup, that's like, let's say $4 million just to get out of the gate, yep. you know, all in. It does create a barrier um, for yeah, a lot no, of... No question. Know, I mean, I think, it's prob I think it's one of the biggest problems in the industry that goes unspoken at the moment. I mean, I've, I've been out there, we've raised money with Topspin, and I've been out there and seen how hard it is um, to raise money for a music company. If, if, I, if, if I were sort of the, the, the music industry, the, the, the um, music industry incumbents, I'd be much more worried about this problem than I perceive hmm. that they are. Um, and maybe, hopefully I'm wrong. But the fact of the matter is you're not going to have much innovation in the music space mm -hmm. that's funded by venture capital in the next few years. Um, you know, venture capitalists don't want to touch it. You know, it's a, if, you're, if you are a music-focused business, it's as good as a scarlet letter. Sure. You know, it's, you have people that might, even if they get the, the business model and they think there's something there, they'll still put the music discount on it, right? Sure. Uh, it's the music industry. The music industry's fucked up. I don't want to deal with it. It's too much brain damage. I'm going to pay attention to a different industry. Do you think um, that's why Apple is basically the only name in the game for like, for actual downloads and, and presence and being able to do the whole promotional vehicle and you know they just throw their weight uh, and you know not many companies can say to the labels, oh yeah, those 30 second previews, yeah, we're going to do 90 second previews no. now and you're just going to deal with it. Yeah. You know, there's no counterbalance force. I I think that. Yeah, it, it's true. I think that um, I think that Apple Story is slightly different, though, right? Than that, um, Apple Story is more of of, a, of of the story of the integrated solution that won. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, if you follow sort of the innovator's dilemma mentality, you know, when the technology is not yet good enough, the integrated solution always wins. Mm -hmm. And you know, there part of the reason that Apple was able to win was because of DRM. Right, so right. getting up that hill Absolutely. of DRM, the only way you were going to do it is to build the entire suite yourself, which is what Apple did, or to leverage an existing suite. And the only game in town at the time, 10 years ago, was, was Microsoft. Right. And that whole stack was broken. None of it worked. So you, would, you, know, you, had a, you had this race between an integrated solution where Apple owns the OS, the player, the store, the physical player, and a disintegrated solution where Microsoft owned the OS, Microsoft had the DRM layer, people like us at Yahoo, Virgin, uh, you know, a, a slew of other people tried to build on that disintegrated platform, and then you had devices that were by you know, Samsung, iRiver, mm. um, Toshiba, et cetera, and, and it just didn't work. It didn't, I mean, from the consumer experience, it was shitty. Um, so the integrated solution won, and it gave them a ton of leverage. If, on the other hand, the labels would have said, this DRM thing is slowing the whole industry down. Let's pull it off 10 years earlier than we thought we were going to. I think you would have had a, a, a bunch of really cool services that worked earlier, 
and you, you might have ended up in a different place. I, I think just hope the movie industry will learn the oh, lesson. Oh, yeah, totally. I, I think that's a good point about the integrated solution, and I think one of the things that Topspin excels particularly well at is the fact that it's a, it needs to be a nuanced solution, too. It's not just analog or digital. It's not just, you know, this or that. It's merch. It's, yeah, I want the physical product. I want to bundle it together with a concert experience and that sort of thing. And sometimes I feel, you know, when we get into, like, social networking and music or whatever, there's this perception that, yeah, if you just start tweeting, you're, something's going to happen. We don't know what, but something's going to happen. Um, what do you think, you know, in terms of nuance, uh, the message needs to be for musicians who are, who are just kind of getting their, their start? It's no the, um, so... What, what, I think what I think what we've learned is that there there is there is no one answer on how to on how to how to communicate and how to sell. Um, it's it's definitely about you know owning your customer and owning your niche, and it's not about you know it's the the the, the advent of the internet is not about everything going digital. It's about having more direct conduits um, to who your fans are, so you can actually offer a, a different array of products and be successful. With um, with, a, with a different array of products and a, and a smaller fan base, so I think you know, the answer to the question is is that it's it's kind of simple. It's how do I offer value to my fans, and what's the value exchange um, between between me and my fans? I'm not going to lie; it, it's not easy. I think that there are there are a, a um, you know it's it's hard to to make money and to get to get people to really. Um, you know, cough up money for, for for music at this point. They have a lot of things they can spend their their not just their money on. They have a lot of things they can spend their attention on. Mm. Um, so so you really have to um, you know st you really have to do something that stands out ab above everybody else. No one's going to settle for a mediocre experience anymore. They're not going to listen to your music just because it's the only thing on the radio right now. They have unlimited choice. Right. So you have to have something that they're going to actively choose. And then if you want to make money on that. You've got to have something that they really want that's that's a value. So I think I think you know the the advice that I usually give for for starters is um, you know first of all it's about the craft it's about the art. You're not going to be no one no technology is going to help sell things to people that they don't want. Right. It just won't work. So so the, it has to start from art and something that people actually desire. Then though step two is not okay. I made some art now let's sell it. You've got to go through the, the process of building awareness around that and then build, making connections to fans. And if you've, if you've got something incredible, if you've built awareness around it and then you've connected to people who are going to help you build more awareness, that's where then you can turn around and offer them something of value and, and, actually, and actually make money. At what stage in an artist's career is Top Spin the right answer for them? You know, that, that is becoming sooner and sooner. Um, you know, we, we started by really trying to build a professional grade solution. Um, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to build our, I, I firmly believe that you will always serve your customers. You know, have, in, in, this, in the software development world, it's inevitable. Whoever your customers are, that's who you build software for. So you kind of have to, you know, to borrow from the 37 single guys, you have to hire the right customers. So for us, we really wanted our customers to be professional artists, not, not necessarily hobbyists, not that it couldn't be hobbyists, but we wanted to start building a suite of tools that was really useful to people who had a business to operate. Um, so there are certain things that the software needed to do um, in order to do that uh, in terms of you know, just some of its boring like fulfillment and taxation and, and paying rights holders and you know, legal compliance and all this sort of stuff. Um, but some of it is just functionality. You know, we had a gigantic um, on sale with Lincoln Park this morning and it's, it involves gated access to very expensive tickets and it's not you can't it's not for the light you know we're not for the faint of heart right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but what we're doing now is we're trying to bring that feature set to more and more artists so that if if you are a hobbyist and you say I want to use what the pros use um, that you can easily get onto the platform and use that so we're we're um, you know the the bottom line is I think it's I think Topspin in the not too distant future will be for everybody um, and and the people who will Sort of level up. Mm. It'll be you know it'll be people people who are making you know if you're if you're going to make two three thousand dollars a year direct a fan then, then you're, all, you're already in our sweet spot. Yeah. So as somebody who knows just enough about Pro Tools to be dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, I, I it is 
it's a two-way street. The, you can open up and be more accessible, but also it's part of just upping your game as a musician and a promoter of music to learn the new tools, to take the time to really get the most out of them. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it ha it's, it's not unique to this industry, right? I mean, even if you look at Apple and the way that they market iMovie versus Final Cut Pro, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, just put the two home pages yeah. next to each other. Final Cut Pro says, you know, this is a, uh, the, the best tool for professionals. iMovie says, you know, make home movies fun. <laughs> right. You know, and, and we're, we're, yeah. we want to be Final Cut Pro, not iMovie. We're not, we're not, you know, garage band. We want to be Pro Tools. And I, I think that's, that is a great place to be. So uh, you just, San Francisco office moved to a new location. How's that going? It's is great. It? It's a great good. office. And a holiday party tonight, I Holiday hear. party. Very come good. on by. So uh, come. I'm actually going to jump on a plane, but Amy's going to be there. Okay, sure. good. Did you uh, bring your skateboard to San Francisco this time? I have, a, I have a skateboard that lives in San Francisco. All right, cool. <laughs> well, good to know. Uh, thank you for sitting down with us. Yeah, and sure. I'm looking forward to your panel uh, this afternoon and learning what I can learn from uh, the big four. Cool. So, uh, thank thanks you. For yeah, thanks for taking the time, man. Yeah, Appreciate no it.